So every household and every family has their own unique, particular culture, uh, the way things happen within the home. And I think we're all aware of that. And uh, when I was in high school, of course, and many of us when we were in high school, we would visit our friends and spend some time. Sometimes we'd spend the night or, or we would just be there for a meal or, or whatever. And so in our home, there was, there was a pretty much of an understanding. And I was, I suppose, typical of a lot of teenagers that I didn't always perfectly agree with my parents and would sometimes express that verbally. And sometimes it would get a little bit intense maybe even heated it could be described as and so we would have arguments from time to time it wasn't there was a lot of it but there was some of that but it was generally understood that when you had those disagreements and you had to express yourself you didn't do it when you had visitors in the house you didn't do that when there were when there were people there uh, you saved that for those special moments when you were together as a family uh, however not all of the friends that I had in high school had that same understanding or that same culture in their households and the, it wasn't uncommon for a few friends that I would visit uh, that they would have these arguments right there in my presence and so the, the teenagers or in some cases it wasn't necessarily my particular friend but they may have had another older brother or sister or something like that and they were having these arguments and so of course there's nothing more uncomfortable than to be sitting there in that kind of argument where you've got uh, the parents and the children going after one another and screaming and shouting at one another and literally in some cases that was what was going on and you're just uh, <clears throat> let's see <laughs> I think I hear my mom calling I have to go back uh, and so uh, being an observer another kind another situation where at least I find it in modern culture where it's a little bit uncomfortable is when you're part of half of an argument while you're standing in line at the grocery store. You know what I'm talking about? When somebody's on their cell phone and they're having this, this whole conversation and they're shouting and screaming at whoever it is that is on the other end and you're privy to half of it. And again, you're just sitting there wondering, well, is this, is this moment ever going to pass? And so it's very uncomfortable to be in a situation where you have to be part of other people's disagreements, other people's arguments, other people's uh, problems and, and conflicts. And we've reached a point here in the letter to the Philippians that Paul is about to deal with one of the most sensitive problems that he's had to deal with thus far in the church. And he has, up to this point, he's prepared the congregation in Philippi with some good, solid reminders of the power of God in their life, and he has encouraged them to seek those things which are higher and greater than the ordinary things of this life. He has already, and we've talked about them as we've worked our way through the, the letter to the Philippians, he's already addressed the other problems that the church was facing. Those were problems primarily caused by outside sources. It might have been the Judaizers who were trying to, to tell the believers that they needed to go back under the law of Moses. They needed to be circumcised. Uh, those kinds of issues that they were dealing with. Or back in the first chapter, there were, these, um, there were these teachers that were trying to gain personal recognition and trying to get a following from among the Philippian believers. But primarily, these were individuals that were not part of the congregation. They were outsiders that were coming in that were trying to gain influence and control in the church. It was much easier for Paul to use strong language to describe these people that were seeking to take away the blessings that the Philippian believers had in Christ. Paul, however, now had to deal with one of the most difficult problems that any pastor has to face, and that of conflict and carnality among the solid and committed members within the congregation. So Paul begins by identifying, first of all, just how important these individuals were to him. He uses terms of great endearment. He says, therefore, in verse 1, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. He describes the believers as his dearly beloved brethren and his joy and his crown. Now, Paul was not interested in constructing monuments to himself 
or even establishing any type of organization beyond these local groups of, of believers, these local churches that gathered regularly in the name of Christ for worship, service, instruction, and fellowship. But he was interested in the well-being of these individuals that he had worked so hard in the Lord to try to, to bring them to faith in Christ and then to bring them to maturity in the Lord. He calls them his crown. The crown that he spoke of, the word that's used, was used in the secular world for an athletic event similar to our Olympic gold medals. They were awards that were given in the games that the uh, that they, the Greeks would participate in, and they, they would be awarded these, these wreaths that were called a crown, or the word that, that we are translate as crown. It's probably not the most accurate word uh, to translate from the Greek into the English, but that's the way it's primarily been, been translated. And so it was, um, it was a word that was used for a variety of different things in the New Testament to refer to different concepts. In some cases, it was in reference to rewards that were given for service to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, which is probably the main passage where we see this, this used, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul speaks of striving for a crown that is imperishable. Now again, the crowns of these ancient athletes that they wore was made of leaves of some kind. There were a, a variety of different types of foliage. Laurel, oak, parsley, ivy, even lettuce was used to make these things. But one thing that, that all of these Roman rewarded, re, rewards were, had in common was that they would eventually wither and die. Paul said, however, that the, crown, the crowns that the believers were pursuing were imperishable. They will not wilt, but they will last for eternity. And this is a reference in 1 Corinthians 9. This is a re reference to rewards for service. Now, Paul, James, and Peter also use this idea of crowns. And these are, are, are rewards, or these are, these are things that will be given to all believers. Uh, it doesn't seem to be tied to their, to their service or to their works or to, to the things that they do for Christ, but they will all receive these. James, in James 1.12, speaks of the crown of life. 1 Peter... Um, 5.4 speaks of the crown of glory. 2 Timothy 4.8 says that there will be a crown of righteousness that waits for all those who love the appearing of the Lord. It says in 2 Timothy 4.8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. Now here in this passage, however, Paul is using the phrase a little bit differently. He's not talking about uh, something that we would receive as a reward or as, as part of our salvation, but he's using the term to speak of the believers themselves. The same sentiment is expressed likewise in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, which says this, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So Paul believed that the greatest reward that he could have for his efforts for Christ were the other believers who loved and served the Lord. He was thrilled when he saw other people serving God. And he used this language of endearment to describe how strong his sentiment was for them. Now this is in stark contrast, think of the way he, he referred to these other uh, people that were causing problems in the church. Very, very different language he uses as he's talking to the people in the church that were having these conflicts, that were, that were arguing and, and causing these divisions. If you remember the Judaizers, he calls them dogs and evil workers, and he says their God is their belly. Uh, and, of course, it's much easier to say that to people who were not going to be, when he got out of prison and went back to Philippi, he wasn't going to see those people. They were not going to be there. But uh, he wasn't going to say those kinds of things about the people that were going to be in the congregation when he came and actually visited them. But Paul shows, however, through the words that he uses, that one of his top priorities in ministry was the people to whom he ministered. Paul certainly, he was a big vision man. He understood the eternal significance of the message that he was proclaiming. 
And he likewise recognized that this gospel of reconciliation and the fact that all men had the potential to share a common brotherhood through a relationship with Christ was, was revolutionary. He understood the big picture concept of all of this and that it had the power and it actually eventually did transform human history. As, as you know, in the, in the book of Acts, it's described, Paul's ministry was, he's described as the man who turned the world upside down with the, with the way he presented the gospel of God's grace and as the world embraced it. And, and it had impact throughout all of history. So he understood this grand vision for the work that he was called to do. Yet despite this grand vision of social and spiritual transformation, Paul realized that the work of God really takes place in the heart of each individual one by one. Often we think of ministry in big picture terms. Mission scholars talk about people movements in which whole societies uh, have been known to come to Christ as the gospel is presented to them and, and then a whole tribe or a whole group of people will en masse, they will, they will convert and, and become Christians. And even in our local churches, we tend to focus on, on, on aggregate kinds of things. You know, what's the, how many people were there? What was the attendance? What was the offering? Looking in terms of numbers. For Paul, however, ministry was always personal. It was an individual making his or her own decision to put faith in Christ and what he has done for him in the gospel. And it continued to be focused on each single person continuing to make choices, even after that initial choice of salvation, the initial decision to, to trust Christ as Savior. It was individuals making that choice to bring glory to God through the decisions that they make throughout the rest of their Christian life. Paul, even though he did have this big picture of all that was, was taking place through his ministry, he never lost focus of the importance of reaching the individual, of talking to one person, one at a time, and having them individually make choices and decisions that would bring glory to God. And this is a lesson that I've learned, and it's been reinforced in a very strong way for me in the last 10 years as I've taken on the responsibility of being the pastor of a church. My ministries have been about 30 years now in the ministry, which is almost a frightening thought for me, actually more than 30 years. And um, a lot of the ministries that I had prior to that, especially when I was on the mission field, there was a tendency to see things, once again, as groups. We did a lot, a lot of the work that I did, I did in conferences, or I did as uh, uh, mass evangelistic meetings, or, or with committees that were overseeing different aspects of ministry. And it was easy to lose that sense of the individual. And you, you just see things, you know, we used to check, we used to, we used to uh, count the number of churches that were planted. Well, there you're talking about groups of people and, again, seeing things in the aggregate. And so, as becoming a, a pastor of the church, and you see that this is where God really does his ministry, he does his work through the local congregations, I've come to appreciate the importance of each individual person and how, how that's where, the, where God is really working. He is working in the hearts of individuals, and he is guiding and leading them to walk according to his will. And, and, and this was something, despite Paul's his, his amazing sense of, of, the, uh, of the grandness of the ministry that he had, he always kept that at the forefront of his mind. And that's what we see him doing here in this passage in Philippians. Paul had the ability to view his work from both perspectives, from the big picture of the great spiritual movement that he was introducing to the world, and at the same time, he never lost sight that any great movement is nothing more than a collection of individuals, each living out his or her life, seeking to know and to do God's will for their life, often struggling and stumbling as they're doing it, but trying their best. He valued the individual believers in the same way that God himself values us. That's why Paul was so concerned about the individual, because he knew that God was concerned about the individual. We, as human beings, are the height of his creation. We are made in his likeness, and that's, thus each human soul is of infinite value to the Lord. Jesus described just how important the individual was when he said these words, 
Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. And there's so much in the scripture that informs us that each individual is of tremendous value to God. And this, this is, is in stark contrast to what we're taught through uh, when, when uh, in, in, in the secular world. Of, of course, Darwinism doesn't care about the individual. Evolution is not concerned about the individual. Evolution is concerned about the species. It's about the, the, the congregate, the, the congregation of all, all of that particular species and the survival of the fittest. And it doesn't matter. You can, you can sacrifice the individual as long as the species survives. And that's, that's the secular world that, and, and, the, and the teaching that, that we are going to be receiving from the world around us. But God has focused very much on the importance of each and every single individual. And Paul is recognizing that here, and he addresses individuals now. So you think of what he's doing. He is writing this letter that's going to be preserved for the rest of history. It's going to be written down. It's going to be kept for all, for, for people to read for the next 2,000 years. Billions of people are going to read this. And he's addressing two individuals within the congregation who were causing an issue. And he's used, this can be used then, and it has been used for, for, for millennia, as an example then of how to deal with these kinds of issues, these kinds of conflicts that are faced within the local congregation. So let's look at the problem that he was addressing here. We see this in chapter 2. So beginning in verse 2, we have recorded the names and references of several individuals, two in particular, but there's a number that are actually referenced here, not necessarily, some by name and some not. Uh, we have references to individuals within the Philippian church. This is one of the things that modern Bible scholars look for when evaluating the authenticity of the epistles of the Bible. Now we, of course, um, for most of us, we just accept the Bible, accept the canon of Scripture. This is what, what God gave to us. We've had it for 2,000 years or almost 2,000 years. And, and we don't worry about, well, was this legitimate? Did God really, or did Paul really write this? But modern Bible scholars, liberals as well as conservatives, deal with those issues. And one of the things they look at to try to determine and ask themselves, uh, is this an authentic, this, was this really written by the person who claims to be the Apostle Paul 2,000, some or almost 2,000 years ago, is they will look at these personal references that uh, in the ancient times, at the time of Paul, there were a number of writings that were circulated in the early church that were false. They were forgeries which claimed to be written by the Apostles, but they were not authentic. However, such letters usually did not contain personal references to specific individuals such as this. The forgers, really what they were trying to do was to introduce false doctrine, claiming that it was being written by the apostles, and then trying to get their ideas, their false teachings, to infiltrate into the teaching of the church. And they didn't take the time, and they didn't seem to have the imagination to make up scenarios describing these kinds of interpersonal conflicts. And so if you look at these false writings that were eventually, when the church was putting together what we call the canon of scripture, the, the accepted books that, were, that we now have as part of the Bible, um, if you look at the ones, there was a whole body of, of writings that, were, that the church recognized these are false. These were not written by the apostles. They're not legitimate. We're not going to put them in what we call the Bible. One thing about them was, for the most part, they did not contain these kinds of personal references. They didn't look like they were written uh, to address a particular situation. They tended to be more general statements of doctrine or truth, that kind of thing. And so as scholars today, 2,000 years later, are trying to say, well, how do we know these were written by Paul? These were written in, in, uh, in legitimate letters. They'll look at something like this, and Philippians is, is one of the best, Philippians is one that, that any Bible scholar will say, this has to be authentic because look at, you don't make this stuff up. You're not going to write about these two women that are bickering and arguing if you're just trying to introduce false doctrine. So he's, they'll, they'll look at this and it, it just has this, this sense 
of uh, this, this, this big sense of, of authenticity, that he's dealing with what was really an issue that the people were facing at that time. So uh, the problem that he dealt with in this passage, it just has this, this ring of being entirely authentic. This isn't the kind of things, as I said, that people are going to make up. The problem he is about to address is likely one of the most stressful that he had to deal with thus far in the letter. It was easy to talk about these outsiders, the Judaizers. I mean, he had plenty of practice condemning them and, and their teachings and these, these other teachers that were dealing with uh, try, just trying to, to get a following and, and to, to engrandize their own reputation. No problem talking about them flat out. But now we've got these two ladies who are part of the church. Most likely they may have, been come, they may have come to Christ through Paul's ministry himself. They were close to him. He probably was good friends with both of them. And they had this conflict amongst themselves. And now Paul had to write something to address this, this issue that they were facing. And so uh, while even though these issues that the Judaizers and the other false teachers were, were, were dealing with, they could have devastating long-term results in terms of compromising the truth of the gospel message and distorting the, uh, the believer's understanding of the grace of God in the Christian life, this problem was going to address the actual functioning of the church on a day-to-day, real-life level, right in the context in which they were living out their life, in which the believers have been called to act as representatives for Christ, and yet they were having this problem with one another. And this could have potentially serious consequences within that little church in Philippi. The reality of this situation, it's so, when you think of it in those terms, and I think of it as a pastor, it's, it's just, uh, it's almost scary. It's so real life. It's so authentic. It's so, this is what people deal with every day in, in you know, the congregational life. They did, what, they did it 2,000 years ago, and they do it today. And so let's take a look at this situation based on the text and see what he's dealing with and how he, how he encourages them to resolve this problem. So you have two players, two main players in here by the name of Yodia and Sintiki. You'll hear different, diff, they're pronounced in different ways and I'm not sure anybody knows exactly, so we'll just call them for Yodia and Sintiki. Um, we really know nothing else about these two ladies. We know that they're ladies because... Um, Greek scholars identify them as feminine names, so that's how we know that they are two women. Uh, we don't know anything else. It's the only place in the Bible where they're mentioned, and uh, most likely these were they were part of the ten percent. You know, they say ten percent of the congregation does ninety percent of the work. They were probably among that ten percent. They were the active ones. They were the ones that were there for every fellowship, every meal, every activity, every prayer meeting. They were the ones that were there. Okay, so they were the ones that were really taking, were taking on the responsibility of ministry in this local congregation in this Greek city of Philippi. And they, uh, they had an important history with the Apostle Paul in their labor. So this was not insignificant. These were, these were close people to him. They were people that were very dear to him, people that he had worked with uh, on a very intimate basis. And many of us can understand what Paul was experiencing in this situation. There, there is a special bond that is developed when you work together with someone in ministry. When you're active in, in anything that one does, when you're uh, organizing an event, when you're, you know, whatever it is that you may have done in ministry over the years, they, the people that you work with, you develop this bond, this, this, this closeness. Uh, and it's a very re unique relationship that's formed. And I think over the years of, you know, I've, I've been involved in dozens and dozens of different things and, and have come together with individuals and sometimes maybe just for one event, sometimes over a long term. Uh, but uh, in either case, those, that activity, that time spent together, you develop this, this unique and special bond, this closeness, this intimacy. And then it becomes very painful when such people do things that create havoc within the body of Christ. And I've had that happen a number of times as well. People with whom I was very close uh, at one time and worked with very, very closely in ministry, something went awry in their lives and in their theology or just in their attitude. 
and they, they turned. Either they, they started teaching false teaching or they just became cantankerous or they just fell by the wayside and were no longer concerned about the things of the Lord. And it's a very painful thing to see that when those kinds of situations happen. And such situations, uh, unfortunately, are very common among believers. And it becomes more difficult than, however, when you have to be the one who has to deal with the problem. And that's what Paul was facing here. The issue that he addressed uh, is, is much more difficult in some ways than just teaching against false teaching. See, this wasn't the issue. The, the Judaizers and these others that have come in and, and were trying to just teach them things that were not true, things that were against Scripture, okay, that's easy to refute. That, you can kind of isolate that. It's not personal in that sense. You're just, this is false, stay away from them, don't pay any attention to them. What you have here is some kind of interpersonal conflict. Now, there were other individuals that are involved as well. There's an individual by the name of Clement, and uh, we don't know exactly what part he played in there, but he's referred to as, as being, in, uh, being part of, of, that, of that issue that was being faced. And then there's another one that he just simply refers to as a true companion, or if the King James might say a true yoke fellow. Uh, some think that that might actually be a personal name, the word that's used there could have, been, could have been used as a personal name, but in most cases it's translated as a companion or a yoke fellow, somebody that they, he worked with. So it's likely, I believe that this person that he refers to as the true yoke fellow or the true companion, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he's... Uh, He's the one that Paul is calling on to resolve the issue, until, at least until Paul is able to come and address them uh, personally. But of course, he's in prison and he doesn't know how long, if ever, he would be able to, to deal with them. So it's likely that this person referred to as true companion or true yoke fellow is one of the elders of the church that uh, perhaps the one that Epaphroditus was going to bring the letter to. Epaphroditus was the one who was going to carry the letter back to Philippi, and he was going to give the letter first and for, first to this yoke fellow or this companion that he's calling on. And he was the one then who was going to have to confront these ladies and tell them whatever it is you're arguing about, whatever your conflict is, whatever your disagreement is, you've got to learn to get along. Well, I'm glad I didn't have that job. But he was probably the one who was carrying the letter, uh, or who was going to receive the letter that was being carried by Epaphroditus, and that's why he's, he's encouraging him, true yoke fellow, help these women. So he was the first one to read this. And then, um, then he also talks about others, just the, or the rest of my fellow workers. So it's possible that maybe sides were being drawn. You know, some were following Yodia, some were following Syntyche. Whatever it is that their conflict was, some had sympathies towards one or the other. And so one thing that I think was very intentional here is that we know that there was a problem and there was a division, but we don't know what it was. Paul does not tell us exactly what the issue is. And I think that's very important because by not knowing specifically what they were arguing about, that gives us, 2,000 years later, removed from the situation, the ability to generalize well, any kind of conflict, interpersonal conflict. If, it, if they were just arguing over, you know, who was going to teach the Sunday school or something like that, well, then we would say, oh, we only deal with this in this particular situation. But by leaving it unknown, we can say, well, this is, this is a way that we can deal with any conflict that's interpersonal, of an interpersonal nature where we're dealing with these two individuals. And so that, that we are able to fill in the blanks and use it and make present-day application to similar situations we might face in our life. So we are looking at a problem in which two people in the church, important, involved participants, spiritual believers, they're not just, uh, not just on the fringes somewhere, but they're, they're deeply involved in the activities of the church. These are the principal antagonists in a dispute that has, to some degree, disrupted the life of the entire congregation. Now, what's interesting here is how he refers to them and to the others in the church. He reminds the parties in this discussion with what amounts to a very direct and even a blunt statement 
that those individuals who are in the midst of all of this debate all have their names written in the book of life. Now, the concept of a book in which God keeps record of the faithful, listing those who have the hope of life, goes all the way back to the time of Moses. After the Israelites had sinned by making the golden calf, the Lord was ready to destroy all of Israel. But Moses pleaded on their behalf and asked that his name would be blotted out of the Lord's book. Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. Then verse 33, God says that he would not block out Moses' name, but those who had sinned. But you see that you have this idea of a book that, where a record is kept of those who are faithful to the Lord, those who have the hope of eternal life. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, uh, a little bit later on in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we get an idea that's, that's closer yet to what we see in the New Testament use of this idea. The New Testament use of this term of a book or the book of life, in which God keeps a record of those who will be granted eternal life. Those whose names are written in the book will rise to eternal life. Those whose names are not in the book will be resurrected to eternal condemnation, as it says here. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt." And then this idea is carried on yet in the New Testament. Likewise, the idea of this book, this record of those whose names will be preserved for eternity. Revelation 20, 20 15, one of the most famous, well-known passages. And anyone not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. And then again in chapter 21, and there shall, be, uh, there shall by no means enter in to it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what's interesting, and this is the only reference uh, outside of Revelation and, and another one in the book of Luke that talks about the names being written down. The only other reference to this book of life is here in, in Philippians chapter 4, 4 verse 3. But what, what he's saying here, now keep in mind the context of what he's talking about. You have this dispute going on, you have this argument going on between these two ladies. People are mad at one another, it's disrupting the life of the church, it's affecting the ministry, and it's affecting the testimony of the church in their community. You know, you have these people arguing, has anybody, anybody seen some of the silly stuff that goes on in churches? You read it in the paper or on the internet, you know, where uh, s these people are fighting and then they've got lawsuits going on and they've got just all kinds of, uh, or the police are called out to, uh, to come to a uh, uh, a church service sometime because there was an argument. You know, those are the kinds of things. What, what is the testimony that that gives to the community when those kinds of things happen? It's, it's, it's a disgrace. And so Paul was trying to keep the police, the Roman police, from having to go to Philippi. And, uh, and so, but one thing that he reminds them of, one thing that he reminds them of here is that all of their names are written in the book of life. In other words, of course, he's referring to the believers. He was referring to those who had true faith in the gospel message. Uh, but he says, all those whose names are in the book of life. So what he's saying is that all of these people are saved. They're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And what's more is, you're going to have to go through eternity with them. So you better learn to get along with them now. Because you've got a long time to spend with, with these people. And it's a lesson that all believers need to learn. We have to know that the people we live and worship and minister with in this life, they're the ones that we are going to spend together with in eternity. We must therefore have to keep that heavenly perspective of our earthly relationships, that these are the people that we will have to spend eternity with. And he reminds them, that's why he says this, and their names are written in the book of life. These are the people that you are going to spend eternity with. So what is the instruction that he gives to them? He instructs these two women to be of the same mind, to think the same way, but not just, not just necessarily agree with one another, 
It's not that, well, okay, Iodia, you have to do what Sintiki says. She actually is, has more, her arguments make more sense, or she was the one in the right. That's not what he's saying here. Be of the same mind, but not be of the same mind that one has to agree with the other, or even come to a compromise. That's not the point that he's making here. He's saying, be of the same mind, but what mind is that? What is your thinking? What is, how are you supposed to line up your mind? Well, he makes that very clear several times throughout the letter to the Philippians, what that mind is. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Likewise, he says, joyful or fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 315, therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. And then, of course, this is where he defines what that is. He says earlier in Philippians chapter 2, where he's talking about how they are to have the mind of Christ. The same concept comes out in 1 Corinthians 2.16, where it says we, are, we have the mind of Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when he says to Yodia and Syntyche, be of the same mind, he's not telling them, figure out what your problems are, come to a compromise, and because it could be that their compromise, in either case, is going to be wrong. He's not telling them to, to learn to get along with one another. He's telling them that you have your mind focused on the mind of Christ, on the things of the Lord. On that, that is the priority that you're supposed to have. And whatever your personal issues are, whatever it is that's keeping you from having the mind of Christ, you need to put away. And you need to focus your thoughts on the things of him. It's an attitude of humility and love which Jesus Christ had with which sent him to the cross. It was the mind that was willing to give up his own interests for the greater good of the people that he came to serve. It reflects a willingness to say, I'm not going to seek my own desire if by doing so it will somehow diminish the glory of God. Paul here is not saying that the women have to, to agree on the specific issue that they were in conflict over. It's a matter more of one not insisting that their opinion must be followed or the other, but rather it's that the mind of Christ be the, what, what they're seeking. What is God's will for them? How does he want them to think? How does he want them to respond? And as they develop that attitude, this conflict is going to dissolve and disappear. In a few lines, he's going to tell us the most valuable advice, and we'll look at that uh, maybe not next week, but uh, when we pick this up, when I come back, we'll be looking at the passage where he gives some of the most clear instructions on what that mind should be like. He tells us what are the things to think about coming up in a few verses. Uh, we won't be looking at that today. But he has developed the idea of having this Christ-like attitude in all ways throughout the letter. We saw all of these various references to being of one mind, being of the same mind. He's building up to this passage so as to bring the arguing believers to a point in which they cannot resist this plea to end their disagreement. There are much higher and greater goals that must be attained. Whatever the dispute was between these two individuals, there were far more important things that had to be done. That church in Philippi needed to represent Jesus Christ to that community of pagans that they were in the midst of this, this completely secular, completely depraved society, and they had to represent who Jesus Christ was to that community. And if they were bickering and arguing amongst themselves, they were not going to be able to effectively do that. And so he's calling them to be of one mind in Christ. And it draws us, I think, maybe to another important passage, that instructs us likewise, and this is one that we're very familiar with, where we see this definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, it is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
as he gives this instruction to them, this is the mind that he is calling them to be of one mind of. Not, yeah, just learn to disagree, or learn to agree with your differences. He's saying, this is what you focus on. This is the one mind that you should have in common. And by embracing the mind of Christ, his humility and his servant attitude, we will be able to do far greater things for the cause of Christ than simply taking our own position and our own, this is what I believe to be right, and pushing it through and forcing it through, but being able to recognize in humility and in, in, with an attitude of service to others, this is how we are going to be able to further the cause of Christ. And so he's giving this, these instructions. As I said, what he's saying here is just so authentic. It's so real. It's so much what, what life is like out in the real world. How could anyone say that this book was made up? How could anyone say that it wasn't divinely inspired? Because he's dealing with issues that people face. They faced it 2,000 years ago, and it's just as relevant today. And he is giving us this instruction, this advice, to follow the mind of Christ, to focus our, thing, our thinking on, uh, on, uh, on the values and the priorities and the things of the Lord. And with that, then, we would be able to function and, and work for his glory. And that's what he's asking these ladies to do and what he's calling all congregations of all times throughout history, throughout the generations and throughout geography to come and to have the mind of Christ as the followers of the Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this very relevant, very real uh, series of instructions to follow you. We see how conflict is not new, that, that churches have dealt with it, people have dealt with it throughout history, but yet you have called us, you've given us a solution to have the mind of Christ. As Christ